Good morning. Welcome y'all to Corinth Baptist Church this morning. I want to take a moment and ask you to listen to the words of a prayer that St. Francis of Assisi wrote many, many years ago. And it goes something like this. You, O Lord, were born the Prince of Peace. Lord, make us an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Where there is confusion, peace. O Divine Master, grant that we may not seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is the giving that we receive. It is in the pardoning that we are pardoned. It is in the dying that we are born again to eternal life. You were born and are born and are the Prince of Peace. Let us look forward to strive to be in the center of that peace that is beyond all understanding. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your precious word. Lord, I know that this prayer was prayed so many years ago, but Lord, it still applies today. For it brings us to a realization that you are the Prince of Peace. We ask you, Father, to just during this season, we remember all the wonderful things that are true about you. First of all, Father, that you love us so much that you sent your Son to die upon the cross for our sins. And the Lord, you want nothing more for us than to have a peaceful and wonderful life. Father, we thank you for that. And we ask these things in your Son's precious name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please join us as we sing, Oh, Come All Ye Faithful, 199, and let's stand as we sing, please. We shall sing all three stanzas.
such a beautiful hymn uh, to remember how good God is to us and not that he's any more good to us during this season of, of life as he is every day of our lives, but uh, I think Christmas is an interesting uh, season for us to be mindful um, of all that God has done. If you'll remember, uh, today is the day we have set aside for our um, Lottie Moon um, Christmas offering slash birthday money offering that that we normally do so if you brought your envelope okay if you brought your envelope some of you forgot your envelope didn't you I know you did that's okay we're going to take it up the rest of the month too okay but if you you have it I'm going to ask you to pull it out all right pull it out uh, this is a time for us to pray but I'm going to change it up just a little bit all right uh, if you are a child and you want to help us take up the offering for missions, okay, I want you to raise your hand real quick. You want to help us out? Putting you on. Awesome. All right. So here's what we're going to do. All right. I'm going to ask you to come down to the front. All right. Come on down. If you want to help me out, I need your help. Come down to the front. Okay. Because it's going to be. Or, me. All right. Because it's going to be really hard for you not to give money to these children. <laughs> going to guilt you into giving the missions this morning. All right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Don't give an empty envelope to make them feel good. All right. All right. So here's what we're going to do. There's a couple of men that might want to come help. Uh, some of these they've never taken up offerings. So some of you ushers come help. Come on. You, it's a it's a joint competition, not competition, a joint thing. So I need some ushers. Need some men to come down here to help these kids take up the offering for us, all right? All right. It's time for prayer, all right? All right, so we're going to pray. Thank you for helping us out, all right? Okay? But with your envelope, all right, I want you to think that this money, 100% of the money we're about to give is going to go to the ends of the earth. Jesus came in the flesh to come among people because he wanted to show how he himself was the gospel. And this is a way for us to take that same gospel to the ends of the earth. All right, so let's pray. Let's pray for our missions, pray for our, our money. Lord, thank you uh, for your goodness. Thank you for your kindness. Uh, God, remind us um, how you came in the flesh to save us from our sins, God. Use this money, God, for your glory. Uh, bless the missionaries across the world that are faithfully serving, not us, but faithfully serving you. Uh, God, thank you for those that are going to go. Thank you for our children uh, here, uh, just as we are mindful that you came as a child, God. Um, we're so honored and blessed that you have chosen to bless our church with, chi with children. Thank you for allowing us to share uh, their life with us uh, as they are faithfully brought up to, to love you. God, use this money for your kingdom, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Let's sing happy birthday to everybody in the world, okay? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God loves you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God loves you. Time. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to Sue. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Thank you.
fun time. 194 is one of our favorite songs. Oh, Holy Night. So let's sing all three stanzas of it. 194.
how appropriate, since our Sunday school lesson was only manual, God is with us. The choir at this time would like to sing, I call him Lord. Good. There we go. Sorry. Uh, one of my favorite lyrics uh, from O Holy Night is His law is love and His gospel is peace. Uh, and this morning, as we've already been mindful of how um, in the Advent candle reading, ref- 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 reminding us of the concept of peace, this morning's sermon is about peace and the peace of Christmas. And so I'd love for you to join me as we look at Mark chapter 1 this morning. Mark chapter 1. As we look at how Jesus comes to bring us peace. Uh, Starting on Christmas Eve in 1914, roughly five months after the start of World War I, uh, many German and British troops who were fighting sang Christmas carols to each other across the battle lines. 
And at certain points during this uh, season, the Allied soldiers even heard brass bands joining the Germans in joyous singing. So at the first light of dawn on Christmas Day that year, some German soldiers emerged from their trenches and approached the Allied lines, uh, uh, what we would call no man's land, calling out Merry Christmas in each other's native tongue. Of course, at first, the Allied soldiers thought this might have been a a trap by the Germans, uh, but seeing as they were unarmed, they also climbed out of their trenches and they met and shook hands with the enemy soldiers and the men exchanged presents of cigarettes and plum puddings and what little bit of stuff that they had. And they, they joined in singing carols and, and hymns. And some Germans even lit Christmas trees around their trenches. And there was even a, a documented case of soldiers from opposing sides gathering in a good-natured game of soccer. A certain German lieutenant whose name I can't pronounce recollected in his personal writings, quote, how marvelously wonderful, yet how strange it was. The English officers felt the same way about it. Thus, Christmas, the celebration of love, managed to bring mortal enemies together as friends for a time. Some soldiers uh, even used this short-lived ceasefire for a more somber task of gathering dead bodies to bring them back. This was called the Christmas Truce of 1914. It came only five months after the outbreak of the war and what is one of really one of the, the last really solid documented cases of, of the outdated uh, concept of chivalry among enemies. During World War I, the soldiers on the Western Front did not expect, I'm sure, to celebrate on the battlefield. But even a world war could not, at least here, destroy the the Christmas spirit. Now, I wish I could say that after that happened, peace happened. But it took multiple years for that. And not too long after that, there was another world war. And if we read the Bible correctly, there will always be wars. But Christmas is an opportunity for us to to focus on how we can actually have individual peace among an an unpeaceful world, a chaotic world even. And Christmas is a great opportunity for us to focus on that. So this morning, I want us to look at Mark chapter 1 to consider how Christmas reminds us that Jesus comes to bring us peace. Let's pray. God, our Father, this is your word meant for our edification, God. God, by your spirit, open our eyes that we might all see it. God, I hope we can read it and behold the glory of your Son. And I pray that we will embrace him in that glory and walk in his way. We ask this in your name. Amen. If you read... Verse 1 of chapter 1 of Mark with me. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This is a great place to stop. Look at how Mark starts off his book. He calls this the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. What is the gospel? Quite simply, it is the good news. Behold, I give you good news. A great joy, that's for everybody, the angel says. But more specifically, the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. There is no other good news out there to be found. Sure, we may have news that seems to be good, but the gospel, the good news, is about Jesus Christ. Well, who is Jesus Christ? Well, Mark tells us he's the Son of God. There's so much in this first verse that we could spend uh, what my, my grandma would say a month of Sunday is just talking about it. But this is how he starts this book. For Mark, the advent of Jesus Christ is the beginning of the fulfillment of the good news that was heralded by the prophets. This is important. This is very important for us to understand that the entire Bible is about the good news of Jesus Christ. From Genesis to Revelation, the Bible is about 
Jesus. You may have heard some good meaning people say that the Bible is a roadmap for life. It is not. The Bible is not about us. The Bible is about Jesus. The, the centerpiece of all that scripture is, is the good news of Jesus. W.A. Criswell, longtime pastor of First Baptist Dallas, uh, almost uh, an eternity ago it seems, he, he called this the, the scarlet thread of redemption. And he said, if you remember, it's one I kind of like about uh, my Bible has the red ribbons, but the, the binding holding my Bible together is made up of red. And what he said was, from Genesis to Revelation, we are, it's held together by this central theme that Jesus Christ came to redeem us. He is the centerpiece of everything. Therefore, in Mark's understanding, the gospel, the good news, is more than simply a set of truths, or it's more than just some information. No, it's even more than a, a set of beliefs. It is a person. The good news is a person, and his name is Jesus. The kingdom that God un unveils for us is present in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. We are reminded of that. Everywhere you go during this season, you will hear Christmas songs. And even a majority of them will remind people of Jesus. This is the greatest opportunity for us to share the good news is Christmas. Because you can go into Starbucks and hear Christmas songs about Jesus. You can go into Walmart and hear about Jesus. You can go to any place you want to go, you are going to be reminded of Jesus. But more than being reminded of Jesus, we as believers need to be reminded that the gospel is about Jesus. From the outset, Mark announces that the entire content of the gospel is the person and work of Jesus who is the Christ or the Messiah, and he is the Son of God. Verse 2, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Again, Mark reminds us that the gospel about Jesus is something that was already spoken to us by the prophets. Again, the birth of Jesus, even in the way he is born, was foretold in the Old Testament. This is important. This quote is from Isaiah 40, 3 through 5. Now, this quote speaks of John the Baptist who was to come to prepare the way for Jesus. And more than that, Mark quoting these verses specifically shows how John prepared the way for Jesus to come as a way for our salvation. From its outset, the story of Jesus directs us not to an ethical set of rules or systems or, or a checklist of what to do or what not to do, but it has something more practical and transforming about it. It's a way of salvation made possible only by God himself. Put simply, the way that was being prepared is the way of God, and it is a way that is ultimately a way to Jesus. We need to be reminded always, I believe, about this gospel message. But also look at the place that Mark brings up. Where is the voice? It's in the wilderness. Now, when we think about wilderness, we, we generally think of a place far away from civilization, don't we? That's what the wilderness is. We think maybe of a way of, uh, or a place that was without cultivation, a place that might need work. In the wilderness, we think of the place where God himself met with Israel and made them into his people as he saved them out of Egypt. When we think of the wilderness, we often think of wandering. We use that as a metaphor sometimes for life, don't we? Where are we? Well, man, I just feel like I'm just out in the wilderness. Just don't know where I'm at, don't know where I'm headed, right? So the fact that there is a voice in the wilderness here shows us that even in a place of wandering, there's a place of hope for us because there's a place of a new beginning. Christmas is a, is a time for people that are wandering to be reminded that there is a person who wants to bring us peace amidst our struggles. 
Let me say that again. Christmas is a time for people that are wandering to be reminded that there is a person who wants to bring us peace in the midst of our struggles. Jesus comes to bring us peace because he comes to bring us home. He comes to us when we are in the wilderness saying, look at me. I'm here to bring you peace. Because home is not a place for us. Home is a person, and his name is Christ. For many, Christmas is simply just another season in the wilderness, isn't it? But let us remember this morning that God's word itself is a voice amidst the hustle and the bustle and the stress and the chaos that Christmas can be by reminding us that infinite peace is offered to us in the person and work of Jesus. Verse 4, John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. John was in the wilderness preparing the way. And how did he prepare the way? Simple. He preached. You needed to repent from your sins. (laughs) A real simple message that's been lost, I believe, sometimes. And, And if you think about this concept of repentance of sin... It, it, it starts with recognizing that we are all sinful people that actually need to repent. That's the gospel message. So here he is in the wilderness, which is a place which can be reminded, can be, can remind us of peace in a sense, but only <clears throat> by remembering that we must repent of what brings us to the position we're in to begin with. The reason we don't have peace in our life is because we're sinful people. And often we're in the wilderness because we want to be in the wilderness. But this place of of the wilderness can be also a place of restoration for us because it is a place that reminds us that without repentance, we can have no peace. Folks, we need to be, we we need to, to, to dwell on this psalm. The fact that we are sinful people and our sin separates us from God. And without somebody dealing with what separates us, there is no peace between us and God. Because without repenting of our sins and putting our faith into Christ, the Bible tells us that God's wrath is going to eventually be poured out on us. So Jesus comes... In the wilderness, eventually, as we're going to see in a second, he comes to us and does what none of us can do, and he dies for us, absorbing the wrath of God, thereby giving us peace. This is what we are reminded about in Christmas. John's baptism was symbolic, but it was provisional of something better that was coming. John said, I baptize you with water, but he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is an extraordinary declaration. For in the Old Testament, the gift of the Spirit belongs exclusively to God. But John's declaration transfers the giving of the Spirit to Jesus himself and what he's going to do for us. Once again, that this, he's telling us that Jesus is the greater prophet. Jesus is going to come in the full power of God. So John was telling the people symbolically that while they were in the spiritual wilderness, far worse than the physical wilderness in which their ancestors walked. If you remember, the ancestors walked in the wilderness for 40 years. And John's saying, guys, the wilderness you're in is far worse than that because you're separated from God. The people were in the wilderness of sin and needed restoration. And just as Israel needed Joshua to come and lead the people from the wilderness to the promised land, John called us to leave our spiritual wilderness, trust in Jesus, who's the better Joshua, who's going to give us the better promised land. The wilderness is a place of 
of new beginnings. It's a place of restoration. It's a place of rest because it's a place of repentance. This leads us to peace, which is why Jesus came. Look at verse 9. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. <clears throat> and when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. Now this isn't my, in the notes, but a lot of people, you kind of struggle with the concept of the Trinity. The Trinity is very evident here. There's Jesus, the Son, there's the Spirit, coming and God the Father speaking from heaven. All three members of the Trinity very active in this. This is the first time you see that in the New Testament showing you that this baptism is very, very important. So when Jesus came, before he starts his public ministry, he was baptized by John. Not because he needed to repent of his sins, because he was sinless, but he is coming to identify with us sinful people. And to give also approval of John's ministry. When Jesus comes up out of the water, he, he really experienced three things that signified the coming of the new kingdom. First, the heavens, it says, were opened. Second, the Spirit descended. And third, God the Father spoke. This is an important thing for us. This is an earth-shattering event that shows that Jesus is the more powerful one promised in the Old Testament. And this is showing that this new kingdom's at hand for us. We don't have to wander in the wilderness. We get something better promised. Jesus came and was baptized showing the importance of this new kingdom. And because Jesus comes, we get the Spirit of God in our own lives. We have something better than Moses. We have the Spirit of God within us. It doesn't become, come because we're baptized. It comes because of the work of Jesus on our behalf. So baptism is a beautiful symbol of our identification with the one that became sin for us and died on the cross in our place. And folks, if you're saved this morning here and you have never went through with believers' baptism, you need to. You need to understand you're being completely disobedient to what God would tell us to do. Jesus Christ himself was baptized and, as an example. It didn't save him because he wasn't sinful. It didn't save him because he needed saving. He was God. It doesn't save us. It doesn't cleanse us of our sins. But it is an example so important that Jesus Christ himself did it. Christmas would be a great time for you to get your baptism right. Verse 12. The Spirit, this is right after it says, immediately, okay, baptism, and now immediately drove him out into where? The wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. So the same Spirit that empowers Jesus for ministry now tests him to determine how he's going to use his divine sonship. How's he going to be obedient? How does he test him? <laughs> By driving him back into the wilderness. Don't miss this. This is important. There's this voice crying out about the new way that was coming. And where was the voice found? In the wilderness. Now Jesus is back to where the voice started. Why? To be tempted. Think about this. For most of us, the wilderness is a place where we're tempted, isn't it? Spiritually, when we are wandering in the wilderness, it's generally when, uh, generally when we are in a season of life that's difficult, that's troubling, that's trying. So Jesus, again, coming to identify with us, has to go to the same place where the message came from. The wilderness. Jesus had to be tempted to know what it was truly like to be human. The temptation establishes the free, sovereign will of Jesus himself, who, like all of us, must choose to make God's will our own. Jesus is tempted in the wilderness for 40 days. Israel was in the wilderness for 40 years. Moses was at Mount Sinai 40 days and nights. Elijah was led for 40 days and nights to Mount Horeb. In each instance, these people were in the wilderness, and in each opportunity, 
the wilderness was a season of testing. But ultimately, it was a way for their deliverance. The same contrasts are present in Jesus' temptation. For in the wilderness, Jesus was both tempted by Satan and attended by angels. Jesus comes to give all of us peace in our wilderness because he knows what it's like to be tempted. He was tempted, but overcame. He was tempted, yet was without sin. In the same way, Jesus was crucified, but he overcame it for us because we are people who succumb to temptation. Jesus is not. In the wilderness, our Lord Jesus would meet Satan face to face, but he would conquer where Adam failed. Where Adam's failure plunged all of us into a state of sin and misery, the Lord Jesus Christ came and waged war on Satan and won by his own righteousness. Take heart, folks. Jesus was tempted in order to offer us peace that could never be ours apart from him. So all of us that are struggling in the wilderness, Jesus Christ comes to where we need him to be, and he leads us out through his own work. Verse 14, now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Interestingly enough, Jesus went from the wilderness to another type of wilderness. Jesus didn't prepare for some sort of big missionary campaign, first in Jerusalem and at the ends of the earth. He, he remained in insignificant Galilee. It was an insignificant rural hamlet of a town. Nothing significant was from there. But one, when does he go there? After John was arrested. The arrest of John and the beginning of Jesus' ministry are correlated. Because it shows that the gospel is proclaimed and known in adversity. It's known in our suffering. It's not necessarily known in our ease and in our comfort. Jesus preaches the gospel of God, it says, but more than that, we are reminded that Jesus is the gospel of God. And what does he say? The time's fulfilled, the kingdom of God's at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. It's not much different than the same message that John preached. It shouldn't be much different than the message we preach today, repent and believe in the gospel. But what type of gospel does Jesus preach? It's the same one that Scripture's been preaching the whole time. We're sinful people. And without having our sin dealt with, we're never going to have peace before the Lord. We all stand condemned and need salvation that cannot come from our works. Folks, you, you and I, we are not good people. We're sinful people. We think we're good people because we look at people that are worse than us and say, at least I'm not as bad as that. All we are trying to do is justify ourselves. And Jesus comes saying, you can't justify yourself. But what he does do is he comes and says, I can justify you through my word. So what can we see from this text? Two big things. First is this. I want us to see how Jesus is the perfect sacrificial servant. Jesus is is the perfect sacrificial servant. I want, to see, I want you to see that in three ways. First, Jesus is perfectly obedient to his Father's will, and he perfectly submits to it. This is the heart of the gospel. Jesus does everything that his Father told him, and he did it because he was perfectly obedient. As Christians... We must also be obedient by submitting to the Father's will in our life. We, for some strange reason, we have, we have preached a false gospel that says, if you'll repent and believe, that's all you need to do. When the Bible tells us, yes, we're saved by faith because we're saved through Jesus Christ and what he's done for us, 
But that is where we start, not where we end. We need to submit to our Father's will in our life. We will never have peace. You will never have peace in your life if you don't submit to the Father's will. Second, Jesus is the perfect sacrificial servant of his Father. By being perfect in his temptation in front of his greatest enemy, Satan. This is significant because it reminds all of us that it is only in trusting in Jesus that we can ever have hope of deliverance in the wilderness of our own temptations. What I mean is this. None of us can simply flip a switch and be perfect when we're being tempted. If you think by your own efforts you can be perfect in defeating temptation, you have a vastly superior opinion of yourself than you ought to. We, much like Jesus, need to be mindful of how to deal with temptation. If you go to one of the other Gospels pictures of this, every time Satan attempted Jesus, Jesus responded by quoting Scripture. If Jesus himself has to quote Scripture, don't think you can get away from it. We need to be steadfast in temptation by looking at Christ. And third, Jesus is the perfect sacrificial servant for us by literally being the fulfillment of the good news. Jesus is the good news. That's the good news. That He is the gospel. Jesus Christ is good news. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for who? All the people. Why? For unto you is born this day in the city of David a what? A Savior who is Christ the Lord. Jesus is the perfect good news of Christmas. That's the best thing any of you can have this season. It's the good news that your sins are forgiven, that you no longer have to stand condemned. That Jesus Christ, the sovereign Lord of the universe, came to a poor family in a remote town, lived a sinless life to die a death that every one of us deserved, and he did it because he loved us. That's the good news. So Jesus is the perfect sacrificial servant, but the second thing we see is that Jesus is our perfect peace. Jesus is our perfect peace. And he does this, he shows this in three ways. First, Jesus gives us peace as he submits to his Father's will. Folks, we've got to be faithful in our lives. Not perfect, we can't be. That's why Jesus came. Because we can't be perfect. But we've got to have something we call grace-driven effort. What I mean is that, is that, again, we, we push forward to be faithful in who God's called us to be, and as we push forward, we, were, we are reminded that we can only do it through Jesus' power anyway. And we're going to veer. We're going to struggle. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna want to quit sometimes. But the grace-driven effort reminds us that as long as we keep moving forward in the same general direction through the power of Christ in our life, God is going to continue to bless us and give us peace. Jesus was perfect. We cannot be. But we must be obedient to what God's called us to do. Second, Jesus gives us peace in the midst of our testing. Jesus gives us peace in the midst of our testing. Jesus, who was God, was tempted. Folks, we're going to be tempted. But Jesus gives us peace because he's been tempted in every way yet, as we are, yet didn't sin. Jesus suffered. Jesus wept. Jesus had had issues and he had family issues and he had relationship issues and he was misunderstood he was mocked he was lied about Jesus has experienced everything that we have experienced with one big difference he didn't deserve any of it he understands us and no matter what you are dealing with today you need to understand you can have peace if you will reflect on the person and work of Jesus who is the good news And third, Jesus gives us peace 
ultimately as we trust in the good news. Brothers and sisters, Jesus himself is the good news this morning. He will be the good news tomorrow. He will be the good news next year. He will be the good news for all of eternity because he is the gospel. Too many of us do not have peace because we don't trust in the gospel. Jesus is the gospel. So what does the gospel proclaim to every one of us here this morning? Simple. Repent for the kingdom of God's at hand. That all of us stand condemned in front of a holy God, but because the holy God loves us, he sends his holy son to die for us. Repent for the kingdom is hand is at hand. Repent, trust in Jesus, who is the heart of the gospel. Repent and be saved. This is a simple gospel message, and it has always been the simple gospel message. Our Christmas devotional that that uh, that some of you bought, and I hope you've been going through it. And if you have gone through it, I hope you realize it's a really good one. Um, well, it had a paragraph this week that reminds us of this and this is what Paul Tripp says in our Christmas devotional he says Christmas reminds us of this quote God would take on human flesh and invade his sin broken world with his wisdom power glory and grace but he wouldn't descend to a palace instead the Lord Almighty the creator the sovereign king over all things would humble himself and take on the form of a servant He would live on our behalf the life we could have never lived. He would live on our behalf the life we could have never lived, and he would willingly die the death that you and I deserved to die, and he would rise from the tomb as the conqueror of sin and death. He would suffer every single day of his life so that he could, with his life, give his grace to rebels extend love to those who would deny his existence, impart wisdom to those who think they know better, and extend forgiveness to everyone who seeks him. His coming stands as an affirmation that he will not relent, he will not be satisfied until sin and suffering are no more, and we are all like him, dwelling with him in unity, peace, and harmony forever and ever. That's the gospel message, and that's what Christmas reminds us, and that's the only way that any of us can have peace. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for offering us peace. God, in a crazy, chaotic world, God, we are mindful that you are so good to us because you love us and because you were perfectly obedient to your Father's will, God. We can have forgiveness of the sins that we have and have peace between you. God, for those of us here this morning, maybe, maybe they have not had their baptism right, God, I pray that you would call them to, to be obedient in that. God, for maybe for some of us here this morning, we're just not saved, and we need to, to, to recognize that we do need to repent of our sin and trust in you. God, for some of us that, that are saved, we're just not walking in obedience. God, I pray that you would pierce our hearts and, and push us toward faithfulness in our life. God, whatever business you would have for us to do, God, I pray that you would touch us and convict us and call us to obedience. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. I'd ask you to stand as we sing a hymn of invitation. Again, the altar. Number 13. Number 13. The the altar will be open. Uh, I'll be down here. There's plenty of people around here that would love to pray with you. Whatever business, folks, you need to do with Jesus this morning, please do that. Mm